Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to day three of Sword Squatch 2020, Cyber Squatch. Once again, awesome to have you here. Really uh, happy you could all make it and hope you've been enjoying Cyber Squatch so far. Uh, once again, I'm Aiden. I'm one of the, the Sword Squatch founders. Um, uh, the moderators today are going to be Carrie Patrick and Michael Garvis, and we've also got Eric, another uh, another another founder. Um, today we got Mike Sherba doing some stuff about George and Sword and Buckner. It's going to be pretty fun. Um, just some quick reminders for all of our sessions. Um, please do read our, our code of conduct. Remember that Black Lives Matter. Uh, be kind to each other. Be patient with us as we work through any technical difficulties. Um, if you fail to follow the code of conduct, we will just be sort of removing you from the event, and that'll be that. Um, we encourage you to use the chat and the Q&A feature to ask questions. Uh, we will basically relay, relay those questions right to Mike. Um, any questions you have as we go, uh, let them at us. Um, yeah, and ask that, questions, please. Oh, yes, and please ask questions, because Mike has answers. And I got, I got nothing else past that, so take it away, Mike. All right, so thank you all for being here. Um, I will apologize in advance if we get interrupted or there's noise. Um, we, air quality near Portland is really lousy right now from the fires, so there was a, a hasty uh, moving of this from my dedicated practice area in the backyard where my pallet stuff is to inside. We had to move furniture, and my family is all very nicely for us hiding upstairs so we can do this. Um, Game plan is we're going to go through a few brief slides about Georgia and the, the Kevser Sword and Buckler system. And then the rest of this is really all about a series of drills and applications for developing active use of the buckler, no matter what system of sword and buckler you study. Um, Georgia kept the sword and buckler in use actively into the 20th century. And as such, they preserved certain things and certain attributes that the other forms of sword and buckler we had to reconstruct from uh, texts and pictures and manuals and drawings um, have trouble to convey. Now, it brings its own challenges in terms of the fact that it's not written down and recorded terribly well until the 1950s. Um, and then by an outsider rather than somebody who practiced it his own life. Um, but there's a lot for us to learn and a lot of lessons we can take and apply to other systems of sword and buckler. Um, I'm gonna ask for those who, people who are participating, I hope everybody has a buckler of some sort and a single-handed sword of some sort or a stick or whatever. Um, I've also got a few other offhand things that we're gonna use to talk about as we go through this. Um, but before we get started on the technique stuff, a little bit about Georgia. Um, so where is Georgia? So here we can see uh, Georgia right smack in the middle of our map, um, bordered by, you can see, you know, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Russia to the north. Um, you can mm -hmm. see where it's close to Greece. Um, they were a major ally with the Byzantines, um, but probably more than anything, three major powers shaped Georgia's history. Turkey to the southwest, Persia, now Iran, and Russia. Uh, you'll notice two of those three are Muslim, and only Russia is Christian, and this plays a big deal in things. Religion, Religion is an interesting thing in Georgia. Um, most of the country is Christian, but it's especially up in the Kevser Highlands where they preserve this form of sword and buckler, it's an unusual form of Christianity that mixes a lot of pre-Christian pagan elements, bits of Islam and bits of Judaism um, into their uh, Christian practices. So for those playing at home, um, Georgia in Georgian is called Sakarvelo. Um, and Georgian itself is called Kartvelin, the language. It is a language isolate. It's not Indo-European. Um, there are roughly four other languages related to it still in use, and most of those by very small groups. Um, the population of Georgia is only about 3.7 million. Just for comparison, for those in the Pacific Northwest, 
The Portland metro area is about 2.5 million. So we're over half of the nation of Georgia, just in Portland. And we don't think of ourselves as a particularly large city. Um, it has an area of rough, just shy of 27,000 square miles. Basically, it's the size of West Virginia. Uh, the northern border of the country runs along the spine of the Caucasus Mountains. Um, and those mountains and the people who live in them are very important for this. They're the ones that preserve this form of sword and buckler fighting into the 20th century. Um, all of us probably had to read Jason and the Argonauts back in school. Um, and in Jason and the Argonauts, when they talk about the land of the Golden Fleece, that is Georgia. Uh, the old way of uh, gold mining in the, in the Georgian mountains was to take a fleece, a uh, sheepskin, and sink it in a gold-bearing river with rocks, leave it there and let the water flowing over it deposit the, uh, the gold in the fleece, remove it, and cart out the, uh, the gold from the fleece. Um, because they were sort of between this three-part, much larger powers, um, they had to constantly fight for their independence. Um, so there's, to this day, uh, wearing of daggers is part of national formal costume. You will see people wearing a kanjali um, as part of their formal wear. Uh, weapons and fighting were very important. Um, Georgia has been broken apart and reformed and partly conquered and reformed by a lot of different people over the years. Um, and it wasn't even unified fully until the Bagrationi dynasty in the 11th century. Um, probably the two most important monarchs in Georgian history would be David the Builder and his granddaughter, Queen Tamar. Um, Tamar, the, the, the years under, under King Tamar, as she was actually crowned back then, um, and she was co-monarch with her father before he passed even, um, are considered the golden age of Georgia. Uh, for those people who like the civilizations games, uh, the, um, she's, when they added Georgia as a civ, she's the monarch they chose. She's, she's huge in that history. Um, within Georgia, that red province in the, in the upper right is kept Serenity. Um, it's bordered to the east. Um, here by Svaneti, and uh, I've, to the west, I forget the other province, but this is really remote. Um, the country may only be the size of West Virginia, but getting up to Kevsereti is a pain in the rear. There are places where you can see from one village to another, but it's a three-day walk to get between them, because you have to go down the cliffside, across to where you can cross the river, and then up the other cliffside, even though you could yell back and forth. Um, and all of this contributed to keeping the, the martial arts there alive. To give you an idea of what Kev Serenity looks like, um, this is a photo from some friends of mine um, in an expedition uh, a few years back up into the Kevser Highlands. Um, now this makes it look really bleak and barren and all this. Um, this is what a Kevser village looked like. You'll notice everything is built from stone and everything looks like a collection of fortified towers jammed together. That's because it is. Um, fighting and martial arts was an integral part of, the, of life in Kev Serenity. Um, again, as late as into the mid 20th century. Um, the traditional pattern of living, like many highlands, is that the livestock live in the bottom of the tower and the family live in the floors above them. Um, and there's all sorts of things here where even like Easter celebrations, the youth go around trying to steal the prepared feast food, and if they steal it, the people they stole it from have to serve at the Easter feast. If they get caught, they have to serve at the Easter feast. It's um, everything to do with fighting was, was a big, big deal in this culture. Um, as we can see, you know, here are some images from the, the 19th uh, century. Um, on the left, you can see a couple of Kevser children. Um, note the wicker buckler and a stick. But also note that these are very young children and they already are carrying what amounts to a short sword. Um, the Kanjali that they carry is big. Um, they're fun to play with too, but that's not what we're talking about today. Um, in the middle, you can see traditional Kevsar sword and a buckler and belts hanging. In the bottom right, this is a, a woman tending a cradle. If you look very carefully, 
at the, along the edge of that cradle, there is in fact a sword strapped to the cradle. Um, this was not like unusual or staged. This was very common there. Um, in fact, there's, and I could go for hours about rules of etiquette and when you take your sword off and what do you carry with you when you go into somebody's house and all this. But we have people who were wearing, seriously wearing male armor and fighting with swords and bucklers to settle disputes uh, into the 20th century. Um, this particular photograph, I believe, is uh, 1909-ish. Um, and I'm going to rapidly kind of go through a few more of these um, photos dating from the 1890s up through the 1930s. Um, so you can see this tradition and how it lived. Um, and this is pictures uh, 1930 uh, from some exhibition. I have several from this exhibition. And you can see how these guys are fighting. Um, you'll note that the sword and the buckler are joined almost exclusively here, or the two hands are in near proximity. This will prove to be important as we go later. Um, you'll also note people kneeling. That's another fun thing. We're not going to go into that in our class today. Um, uh, more from the same exhibition. Um, I just have a few. This is a different case. Again, we see people demonstrating fighting in mail. Um, fighting in your kit like this was considered both a way of settling disputes and good sport. There are three formalized, ritualized forms of fight in Kepsaren. Parakeaba, which shares a name with a dance, uh, which also involves sword and buckler, which is awesome. I encourage you to go check it out. Um, but Parakeaba, you can sort of translate into English as showing off with sword and buckle. It's all about looking fancy and doing all this stuff. Then there's trotraloba. Trotraloba is, we have a dispute, we want to settle it, but I don't want to kill you because I don't want a blood feud. Then there is lashkroba. In lashkroba, oh, you're from the other side of the mountains? Your people have been stealing my sheep for centuries. Up yours, I'm going to kill you now. Right? So three formal levels. Um, what is recorded is mostly perakeaba, because uh, that was the most common. Um, but we also do have bits of the uh, of Lashkrova and of serious fight uh, as well. A uh, few more fights uh, from demonstration. Here you can see common posture with the buckler low. I'm including a lot of these because you'll notice in almost all of these, the buckler and the sword hands are together. Now. We are talking today about active buckler, right? And here we have a couple more pictures. Um, and I think we're about to the end of the photo. So if we can switch from the slides, let me stop the share and you guys will just shift to the camera on me if that works. All right, am I, uh, yep. am I on the camera here? All right, all right. So we have, our sword, we have our buckler, and we want to develop active buckler. So what I'd like people to do now, if you're playing along at home and not just watching, um, and we've I've tried to tune this for those of us who are at home with maybe a pal, maybe nothing. Um, what we're going to do first is a series of exercises. Um, the first one requires a buckler alone. Nothing in the offhand, um, and it's pretty straightforward. I, I like to do this more with the pal rather than um, we have our stand in pal. Jim's our stand in pal, um, and he's got uh, this uh, blocker thing here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're just going to work boxing combinations for a little bit, um, always leading with the buffer. Um, and after we've done this for a bit, I'll give you, I'll do some of this to show you guys, and I'd like people to do it. If you have questions at that point, please ask. And then we will, uh, I'll explain why we're doing this after we've done it. So, right, yeah, we're here. I want people to be able to see. So, right, so you know, I'm used to the pelt, right? Work the face of the button, hooking, slapping, edge, right? Just get used to moving your buckler and following with your hand. Let me bring it down a little bit. So I can Right? right, all these motions, you want to be used to 
the buckler. And I, this is perfect for the pal, because when you do this, you get this nice thump, and I get feedback. Right? Thanks, Jim. Um, so much of what we see when we do this, I, I watch a lot of buckler fighters, and the buckler's an afterthought. We're trying to fix that today. We want the buckler to move, we want it to be active. In Kevsoretti, there's a saying. The sword goes to work, the buckler blazes the path. This has literal meanings, right? When I'm fighting, I use my buckler to create openings for my sword. But it also has a figurative meaning, which is that in order to use a sword, you need to be able to use the buckler first. Different bucklers and different style of bucklers from different forms of sword and buckler play will give you different feedback and different results when you do this. I like to hit differently with this buckler than when I'm playing Western European and I'm using, you know, this. Um, while both of these will strike nicely with the boss, uh, I find with the rigid grip, striking with the edge is easier than it is with the cord grip on a Georgian buckle, right? So if you've seen how these are strapped with leather cords to grip in the back. Um, so you'll see some minor differences in how you want to play it, but um, it will play, you will get uh, used to it. The point of this is twofold. What we want to do with these drills is get used to the buckler coming first, and we want to get used to impacts on the buckler, significant impacts on the buckler. Um, I've fought sword and buckler against some heavy hitting longsword players. Uh, one guy down in Southern Oregon who basically fights with them on contact. Um, done right with an active buckler, you can shut that down no matter how big the impact they feed you is. Um, and that's important. That's what we want out of our buckler. Um, it's not a static tool to be left out there. It's an active participant. And we're going to spend the rest of the class today um, going on this. Questions at this point? No questions? Boy. All right. Um, we may go through things faster than I would have expected today. If so, I apologize. Um, we tend to do this a lot with uh, form and feedback and discussion. So fortunately, I overprepared material. Um, let's see, what's next? Ah, yes. The next question here is, where does my butler cover well? Um, let me grab my mask here. And I'm going to grab my Georgian butler. Yeah, and my stuff. All right, so uh, let's see uh, if we do it this way. Yeah, this way you can keep me close and we can see. All right, so where can I cover effectively with my buckler? Well, there are obvious things, and I'm going to be very Georgian for a moment here. If Jim tries to hit me in the head, I can cover high well, right? Um, things coming into my left side, I can cover well. Things coming into my right descending, right? I can cover. Um, if he does anything even low over here, right, I can get down here. Then we come into, well, what about over here? If he tries to cut me over there, and this is a lot harder. So what we find is we look at bucklers and buckler use is an arc of use, basically from here, anywhere over to here, right? This is the arc I can cover with my buckler. So, as we do this, sorry, I want to make sure I've got this. Um, we're going to practice some drills next. And these are drills that I'll use. Um, I'll do this with Jim initially here so you can see what we're covering. And then I'll, uh, I'll strip Jim out of the picture and demo this solo for those playing along at home. Um, so, places where I might want to make my covers. Right, I'm here, and all I'm going to do is just the buffer here, and Jim will pick a spot and make a blow here. I cover. 
What do I cover by? I push my buckler towards the blow. Active buckler. Right? We're here. If he takes a spot and covers, I punch towards the buckler, the sword. You'll notice this is a repeat pattern. Everywhere he goes, pretty much, I'm going to punch with my buckler. Um, let's avoid the low ones for now, just because I want to cover that stuff, what we do there. So, right, so um, throw into my right here for a second. Right, I can come over and cover. And in the Georgian system, as I do these, this all looks the same, right? He cuts from, the, from there. I come out with the sword and the buckler together, structured, and can cover it. But you'll notice, in every case, I'm aggressively seeking out his sword. Right? I'm coming towards him. Um, I don't know how many Fiore players we have in, in here today. I find that Georgian and Fiore line up very well. Fiore deals with most things by where is the blow coming from? Attack back at it. Georgian, where is the blow coming from? Attack back at it. Right, it's there. I come in it and it's hard. Now, again, from where we were playing before with our drill, right? I want to practice the same actions, right? If you uh, just leave the sword out there for me, um, yeah, just hold it out in a few different places. So I'm going to practice things like, right? We have a version of this drill that we do, um, and maybe Jim and I will show it at the end with two swords, where I get a buckler and he gets two swords. And I have to cover myself constantly until I see how long I can go before I get hit. It's going to be fun playing this in the house without masks. So um, we'll demo it really slowly because I don't want to get in trouble for breaking anything, myself included. Um, yeah, we're Jim. So we, we see this at this point. Now, we can play these a lot of different ways. Um, one thing that's really important here is when we cover low and to our left and i'm going to go sideways here so you guys can see my my hand um uh let's flip sides because that way you can come across right so um now just give me a a, a low a low blow right Right, so I can come here like this, and this is what we see in a lot of places. But coming low with my thumb up, I can only reach so far. He could come under me here, right? So put your sword at the base of my buckle, you get down to the very edge. Here's how I gain extra space. See how much space I gain? See how far up my buckler is? Just by switching my hand. All right, I was here. Come to my base, you come down to there, and I go, and, he, and I gain half my buckler width. Now, for those playing at home, and I'm a big fan of universal principles, I'm going to be bolognese here for a second. Um, let's, you know, just shift this way. Um, I'll have you, yeah, back to us. Oh, yeah, sure, change weapons. Be like me. I'll see if I can. All right, so we're here, and if you were to thrust to that little opening, I want to come with this. I come down like so. Now, being a, a good fencer, I don't want to waste time, so I will immediately, as I do this, counter thrust. So the action with the sword and dagger ends up looking like this. Straightforward, yes? Gentlemen, so now, gentlemen, can I answer with a question? I have a question, okay? The uh, member of the audience would like you to repeat that last bit from a different angle. They're having problems seeing the space. Ah, excellent. Okay. Um, can we find out what would be most useful if we flipped it 180 degrees or we turned so we were shoot coming straight across the camera? We'll find out. Okay. Uh, there was another question. What was the padded thingy? <laughs> It's just a, um, a strike, a blocking target thing from, uh, from martial arts. Um, I think Century made it, or, yeah, Century training equipment, blocker. Just 
something I happen to have on hand that we could use. Um, it's padded. It doesn't hurt. I wasn't going to break anything. All right, as to the angle, the, uh, the questioner says, I think straight. Straight across? Okay, well, we'll give that a shot. Uh, the measure is going to be tight here. We're going to be a bit artificial here because we are like literally like within reach of each other already. Right? So if I'm here and he comes in, you can see I've swept down and my counter comes immediately behind me. Right? So we're here. Hopefully that's clear. Yes? We'll find out in a second here if the, that commenter comes back to us. We have another uh, bit of a longer question, but it's a, it's a good one. If someone has more experience with a single, hand, uh, single one-handed sword, what are some ways to help train throwing cuts without sacrificing coverage with a buckler? When I train <laughs> solo, I often find that I either end up with poor edge alignment or slowly just lowering my buckler without noticing. Right, so here's where I'm going to be very Georgian and tell you that the best solution is to keep them together in, pra and in practice. This is harder to do with a, a, cruci a, a longer cross on your sword. I'm gonna show this first with a Georgian sword and buckler, and then I'll, I'll pick up a couple other choices here. Um, what I'll do, is, Georgian, is put this together, put my other hand behind it, and literally, you can see, to practice initially, my thumbs are overlapped, right? So I can throw my blows. Um, I need to go sideways. I need this. I need to edge, right? So a simple basic blow from the base would be, if I want to make a big blow here, I'll basically throw a mullen egg. Right? But I can come in and project. And we'll spend a little more time about projection and the different ways we can throw blows, keeping our hand behind the buckler later. Um, so hopefully that's a short answer that gets you started. I know it's not perfect for every style of sword and buckler. Um, I will shift gears here for a sec. Um, I have, I'm going to be a uh, Play some, some 133 here, right? If I were to come in again, I'm going to practice joining my hands, right? As I strike, I want to come together. Um, in some senses, it's almost better to let your buckler come forward initially than to get hung up on this. And we see this in Murazzo, for example. I'm going to space two, right? The very beginning of Morocco's procession to the fight, right? If I start here um, with my buckle like so, the first couple actions end up being he's getting you used to making contact with your buckle. It's big, it's showy, it's flashy. But one of the other things that those that procession will do is you get used to your sword and your buckler interacting. And it turns out, if we want to make efficient use of our buckler, that's really important. All right, now there was another question we kind of went away from. Um, can somebody help me get back on track? Uh, we have a couple of questions. There was the edge alignment one, and uh, we also have the question of, could you show again, possibly from a straight on angle, that very first buckler move where, you, where the edge of his sword was coming down um, below your buckler? Ah, oh, straight on. Yes, let me, um, I'll just grab, I'll just use this buckler for it for the moment. Um, so I think we, I, I should, so let's do this. Can I, Jim, can I have you on that side for a second? We're just going to use you to create a marker. So I'm going to cover a load with my thumb up. So you can you put your sword against the bottom edge of my buckler, All right? So if you watch what happens when I rotate my thumb, Right, so I'm here. You should be able to see this is now near the top of the boss versus before we were, we were here. This is the same motion, and it, it's clearest to see with the dagger, and it is the same motion with the dagger, with the buckler, with the shield. Right, if I'm here and I'm dealing with this and I try and parry like this, 
Mike, if you could step either a little a, a step further forward or back, it's just that there's a dark thing behind you where oh, you are now, so it's, it's hard to tell. Right, let's fix the lighting in here. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, the one middle one. Okay, this should help. Let's see. Um, let's try now with a little bit of light, right? So if I'm, uh, and of course I'm. I want to make sure they can see this, right? So if I parry low with this, see how far the, this, this reaches, he can hit me. If I parry low like so, I'm covered much farther down. And the same, even though the buckler is not a dagger, the same holds true, right? If I'm here and I cover here, and now if I were to rotate my thumb down, I have more space. So when we cover a blow, low into that side, I want to, you know, from, you know, if I'm being Marat, if I'm being Bolognese here for a second, you can be whatever you want to, you don't have to be Bolognese with me, right? I want to treat it like a dagger and come low. Now, in an ideal world, I don't just sit here, right? As that happens, I'm gonna count and we'll spend some time talking about active buckler and the tempo of counterattacks uh, a little bit later. Does that answer the question satisfactorily? I'm not seeing anything, so I believe we're good on that. Okay, um, I will say this. If it does not, and there are still questions, please feel free to PM me afterwards, um, and I'll, I'll do my best to help out after the fact. Um, it may be that when the air clears up, I can get outside and shoot a better video. Um, so, we have this, um, and the next piece of this is so far, everything we've done assumes that our buckler and our sword move unimpeded, right? In any of the uh, high attacks that Jim feeds me, I can cover these with the buckler, without having to worry about where my sword and my buckler are. He goes high to one side, cover. High to the other side, cover. Straight down, obviously, too. I can cover, right? Even, even here to our left, I can cover. Uh, low, low, left, low, sorry, sorry. Right, I'm, I'm here, right? I can cover this. I don't have to move my buckler and my sword. But remember, we ignored the low right before. So here's the problem with this. If I want to cover the low right, Either I have to come way down here, and you'll notice it's hard to see there, but to cover that, my hand sticking out from behind my buckler, or I have to typically here, again, something low coming in there, right? I'm going to cover it with my sword rather than the buckler. Now, this leads us to our first small motion of the buckler, because if I have a buckler here and I want to do this, I can't. Things are in the wrong place. And this is a lousy position to be in. Frankly, I can't use my buckler here, right? I can't freeze to attack him. My blade's bound up, and he's got free entry as he's doing with his buckler. So, everything else we've done are these big motions of the buckler from the shoulder, from the elbow, movements of that sort. Um, here we get our first small motion of the buckler, and I'm going to do this facing the camera first. So I'm here, and I want to clear, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my sword from here to here, just for this, and I'm going to move the buckler out of the way. So the action of the buckler ends up looking like this. It's like this little, I don't know how to describe it. From the side, I'm here, and I'm, I'm pulling it out of the way and looping back in behind it. So as this happens and my blade takes the angle, the buckler just shifts out of the way. We want to simplify as much as possible, but we do need certain possibilities. So now if we do this and Jim attacks down to that side, cover, check, or better yet, I can get it here and I'm jammed. If he tries to hit me with his sword, it's all right up against me. I can jam his weapons with my body, 
and hit. Now we can play lots of different recoveries from there. I can jam this with that, free up the sword and hit, and we can do. The important bit is I'm covered. So as he comes in, oh. and then I counter with the buckler. This is the one sort of really tight motion, right? In our, our system of sword and buckler, I've done my best to reduce the fine motor skills required to fight effectively, right? If, if everybody, you know, if you think about what's easy when you're under pressure and under stress, fine motor skills get hard. This is why we train and we practice them over and over and over. But still, the more we can rely on the easier gross motor skills, the better off we are. Um, however, we can't eliminate fine motor need entirely. And this is one of the places. So here, looking forward, right, as this comes, boom. And you'll notice that as it went, I still moved towards his attack. I'm being very Georgian, very Fiore as well, right? As it comes in, right, we're here, boom. Um, now, that one was high enough that I probably would have just covered. But I can't always cut, right? Um, is it common to get a cut down there? No. More often, I'm going to get a thrust, right? Right? And then from here, I have options and collapse. I like to join. Yeah. So, yeah, and I'm getting close with the mascot. Yeah. Thank you. No, I mean, the other button. <laughs> oh, yeah, that too. Um, breath weapons, that's a beauty. With COVID, we all get to be dragons. We have breath weapons. Yeah. Well, only if we're already sick. We don't want to be sick. So I guess we don't want to be a dragon. I think it's the first time I've ever wanted to not be a dragon. Okay. Um, hey, Mike. Mike, Mike a, we, yes. oh, go ahead. Yeah, there's a uh, there's a quick ask just to uh, if you could show the movement of the buckler uh, switching from top to bottom, just right where you are, up close to the camera. <laughs> sure, I'll do my best to do this without hitting anything in front of me. Can we let's let's move the? Can we just yeah, shift this side here? Okay. So I'm here, and it looks like this. Right from the side, as I do this, was that better visible? That looked perfect, yeah. Okay, good. In retrospect, both of us wearing black shirts was probably a bad idea. And black gloves. Next time. Yeah, well, <laughs> but yeah, lessons learned for this. I, I don't do this on camera that much, and when I do, I'm usually outside in bright sunlight. Yeah. Sound. Nah, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, at this point, anyway, I can I can just shift a bare hand on the sword at least. Um, that should help. My buckler's adjusted for the other. Um, let's see here. Um, and all right. Okay. Um. So let's see. We've covered defense with the buckler throughout actively. We've covered the catch with the sword. Wow. Um, so drills that go with this. Um, and I'll do these sans anything. I usually a lot of this I will do with the pel. I'm going to try and just air fight these um, as examples. Um, because most of us are training at home and we don't have a convenient hand to pass. Uh, so, when I want to train, right, I'll get in and I will practice my covers, right? I'm here, boom, and counter. Just against the pal or against nothing else, or you'll get me coming in and we'll play, boom, boom. Right? Just drilling against incoming shots and thrusts. Where are my most common blows? Descending on this side. Um, we'll see ascending on this side. Um, let me see. Um, actually, let's just walk through the most common blows for a second. Right? When we fight long sword or sword and buckler, um, you just get the buckler like just the common blows. Right? We're fighting as a single-handed swordsman. Straight down, off the side, other side, right, low here, 
low here, right? And then, of course, the one that we haven't touched on, which was for years trying to fight Georgian for me, the bane of my existence, is that low thrust that usually comes under the buffer. This sucks if I'm trying to actively defend it for the buffer. Because if my way of defending is to counter punch the sword, I gotta hope I get that point. So how do we deal with this actively with the buffer? I can't deal with it with the buffer effectively, right? Or I can try to knock it down and it just needs to stab me in the junk instead of in the gut. This is not a win for me, this is a net loss in fire. So when I get these thrusts, I shift. Right? Now here, because it was a thrust, I moved my body out of the way of it rather than toward it, but I follow up while maintaining presence. So really, with the sword and buffer in the Georgian system and the active buffer, there's two modes for the buffer to be. There is the buffer is the initial defender, right? And there is the buffer supports my sword hand. Now, we'll talk in a little bit about different ways the buffer can support our sword hand, because this is not the only one. But in the simplest case, I have my two. Active buffer does not always mean the buffer does the intercept, but it means that the buffer and your movement of your buffer should always be made with the idea of supporting your sword. Whether that be, I'm supporting, right, that a blow comes in, I've stopped it and I've got something and I can play. Or it means I'm supporting the sword hand, right, with this cover. Now I'm doing this all Georgian. I can go ahead and shift gears. Um, and you can say, you're just a sword beating me blows right now. It doesn't matter what you're using, right? But if we think about how things happen, right, in 133, from here, what am I doing here? This is active buffer. My buffer has projected. Right? Up. And it's supported my sword hand. Are my hands safe? Can I be hit? No, he's going to have to come around a big action. And at that point, bad things are happening. Hey, by the way, watch what happened with my hand here as we were here. Right? And as that happened, I went thumb down. I followed that action through. So, natural motion with the buffer. Backhand, forehand, jab, up, down, hook down. Active buckler, you want to work with those. By the way, the same thing as before, right? If I come in uh, here and up from here, I can come, right, to Prima. Um, we see similar actions in Bolognese. It's really weird for me doing this in 133 because I spent so many years trying to eliminate 133 from my fight so I can charge it right. But it's important. Um, so we have these sort of key areas, and we've established methods and ways, drills, to cover and to cover our sword, right? To, to support the sword with the buffer. So you can think of it. But the, the, the buffer has two modes. The buffer is either directly countering something, or the buffer is protecting your sword while you counter it. It's supporting the sword. Um, let me go through here. Sorry, running through my uh, checklist here. Um, what does this mean? And I want to cover this. We're going to change gears in a little bit here and talk about active buffer on striking. Um, and we'll begin that with the thrust and then work our way through. But tempos and our counters. If I am doing active buckler and I am countering with my buckler in the simplest case, and I'm going to be very honest here, partly because it's got the safety tip on it for Jim. I can't slight you. Um, and if I'm being bulleted and a cut comes in from somewhere, what do I do? I cover with my butt there and counter thrust. Because what's more Italian than spiking the as you defend yourself? Very Italian. Right? And with sort of a lot of things, I was going to do this and he doesn't, I come here and counter, right? 
Or if I'm really good, I come into a single temporal tower, I'm not going to do that to be. Um, but typically, in the ideal case, with sword and buckler, I cover and counter in the same action, right? Now, that doesn't mean I have to. I can still, for example, you know, cover and counter in two, right? But I have a choice of one or two temp tempos. With the case where I cover with the sword and counter with the buckler, it is almost invariably a two tempo action, especially if I'm covering my sword hand, right? If I'm in here and I do this once, twice, two tempos, I don't want to do this too soon, because if I do this too soon, he hits me in the arm. I leave openings. I have to first support the sword in its cover, second, strike. Right, so as we're here and it comes in, so well, I did that very poorly. I started to separate two soon. Let's try this again. Right on here, he comes in. Right? Questions on the tempos of these? One or two tempo. We see this a lot. Long sword fighters, we see this a lot in tournaments. People are very aggressive who go for a single tempo counter and strike in one action. When you can pull it off, there's no better feeling in the world. I love it. It's probably tried a dozen times for every time somebody can pull it off. I feel in Sword and Buckler, we see it way less. Um, people tend to stick very heavily with parry repose style fight, which is not always to their benefit. Um, this is especially true, I think, of people who fence we fence, you know, a Bolognese style with a very forward buckler, right, and I'm out of presence and I can make these plays. I have my options, right, I'm here and boom. Single tempo cover and counter. Um, and I could quite happily go into all sorts of theories about that, but that's not what today's class is about. Um, nor am I an expert on that. Well, nor am I necessarily an expert on this. It's just something interesting that I've been studying for more than a few years. I don't know what it would mean to be an expert. Maybe that's one of those goals that I consider. Maybe someday I'll get there. When I'm old and I can't fence anymore, I can be an expert. Um, so there was a question earlier. How do I make sure that I cover? How do I keep my cuts with good edge alignment, everything well supported, and cover my hand with my buckler? Um, while I talk about this, if the person who asked that question could let me know briefly um, in the background, what system they fight, so I can kind of show this with um, with your weapon set. Um, so initially, I'm gonna I'm gonna oh, what the heck? I'm gonna be bolognese here again for a bit. Um, so striking from undercover, and this is a big deal. Like in bolognese, Marazzo will tell you all the time. Yeah, you know, we open things with thrusting under cover. He says thrust under your buckle. Um, later period, I think Donald Gautier says it, I think Paolo Vecini says it later, where he tells you that the common strikes involve a thrust under the buckler, right? Uh, Marazzo staccata, right, where I make a thrust under. And you get into these fun little tricks, like with two, right, if, I, if I'm making a thrust, and I'm being a classical fencer. You want to demo this give you better than I am. Just for my masculine stomach or something. And uh, Mike, yeah. that. Oh, uh... That's fine. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll flip side, right? So, right? In a classical fencer, as we come forward, right? And you make that rising thrust. So, coming, right? You can hit me in the gut. I got lots of patterns here. Right? So, you know, that thrust comes forward, we have cover. You notice, as he impacts his sword hand comes up, he's providing cover against a higher counterpoint, right? He's got options here. So when we play this with the sword and buckler, the buckler provides that cover. I don't have to raise the sword because as I make my thrust, my buckler is covered, right? Now here, his sword, I watch him to the side, so I've done this. The drill, the practice here is going to be, right, I'm here and I want to, so without the thrust for this, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna demo this. Uh, 
Yeah, just yeah. Perfect. All right, and I'm here. And if I want to do this with a pass, I can. I'm going to actually, because of our space, I'm not going to have you go where you were. I'm adjusting for you. Um, so I'm here, and one of the favorite techniques we see in Murata, right? We're here, and something happens, and there's a pass forward under the bucket. But you'll notice what's happening with my hands. As I do this, I'll do this towards the camera here, right? I'm here, I'm out of presence, my buckler's in. My hands join. If you listen to the audio every time, as my thrust lands, you'll hear up. Right? As these two join. Right? Straight thrust up the middle. I can make my thrust and I join. Now, I'm talking about the thrust first for a couple of reasons. Um, honestly, partly because I fight a lot of Georgian where the thrust is underutilized compared to other systems. And I want to make sure that we spend some time on it today. Um, and partly because the thrust is a nice, simple place to start this. It's easier to bring these two together. It feels safer for us, right? As I come forward holding this buckler, right? If I make contact with this, it doesn't feel like it's bad for my foot, right? I'm here, I'm not damaging anything. Versus as I come through and I make a big blow, there's a feeling that maybe I might hurt my sword. I might, it, it's less comfortable for many people. Um, so, um, so that covers the beginnings of the thrust in this. And I, I play these drills, just simple drills like this from across the room, right? I'll do these sand finishing right up here. Um, right, I've got a buckler out, I've got my sword separate, and I come, boom, right? I come in, boom, different angles, right? Different feet forward, I can come straight in. I can come off. I can come off. Very bolognese, and I never get my toe over it, ever since I hurt my knee doing that. Um, Right, so as we strike, typically we join. Um, in Georgian, we'll talk about actions that join, actions that separate, and actions that work together. Um, we teach the actions that work together first, we teach the actions that separate second, and the actions that join third. Was that the way it was always done? I don't know. I find that's a convenient way to introduce it to people. Okay. Did, uh, did we get an answer to the question I asked earlier? Yes, indeed. Uh, so they started with German Longsword and Messer, and more recently have been learning Marazzo and Godino. So the fact that you mentioned Marazzo multiple times, good stuff. <laughs> there's also a, uh, there's another question in the, in the Q&A. Uh, why would one use a buckler to cover low by dropping the arm instead of hip hinging and thrusting high in one tempo? Uh, and then in parentheses, while guarding the hand with the buckler, and parentheses, <laughs> as in 133. Is it to do yes, with the difference? Uh, is it to do with the difference in sword length? Wait, did you already get that one? No. Oh, no, good, good, good. asked it yet today. I was hoping somebody would ask that question. Well, there it is. Um, right, because this is one of the things we see lots of, and I'm going to be very 133 here. I'm going to talk a bit of a difference about how 133 solves the problem versus other systems. So, uh, uh, Jim, I just need you for a second. I'm gonna, I, I need to be able to be a spot. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very 133. I'm going to try and look like a picture here. I'm hip hinged, my butt's popped, and I'm forward. Right? So we're talking about an ending position that looks like this. We see this in Western European manuscripts all the time. It's a great solution. Unless the other person is already so close that that goes by them. Or your other person has studied their Georgian, which I have. In which case, I'll show you what happens when this happens. Jim, do you want to attempt the 133 cover? And, and, and I will be very Georgian in this place. All right. right, so we're in here. We've got to get a, a reasonable setup, right? So here's how I'm going to start. I'm going to come. This is something we see in Georgia. What happens if we're here and Jim goes to do that? So, Go ahead and show where that thrust would go. So do that counter high with the hip hinge. Right, so he's there, right? Watch what happens 
If I drop under, I can reach, I can reach with a cut even, and I'm well under. And from here, with my with that high line cover, what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna remove Jim from this, because bad things happen, is this. It's awkward. 133 and those defenses make some cultural assumptions. One of those assumptions is that your opponent is not comfortable slot squatting, holding a buckler or shield over their head, and chopping you off at the ankles. Um, from experience, this sequence shocks the hell out of a lot of buckler fighters who aren't used to it. Um, so, and we'll make a slight digression because we're in a great spot to talk about um, things. The other part is, well, what happens if, say, we've made contact, right? So I'm here and you've covered me with your bump, right? You push me aside. I'm in a bad spot and you go to cut low, right? Because I'm here. I have to do this. I have no other choice, right? Um, what I find really interesting is that the low guards coming down like this are very common in Georgian, and I see evidence for them are elsewhere in Eastern Europe. I do not see evidence, a lot of evidence for it in Western Europe. Um, partly the other reason is, well, knowing how to cover like this is really important. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be silly here for a second. What happens if Jim, I'm tall, and I'm uphill from Jim, right? Now, I can reach Jim, where is he going to come if he wants to fight me? He's going to come low. I have to be able to fight down here. I have to be able to get low, cover myself low, right? And he just come down here and fight. One of the things we teach in Georgian is that everything I can do standing, I should be able to do squatting like this. Um, I wish I had it on tape, but I had uh, a couple years back, we, we had them on stand out here uh, for a seminar. And the African systems also will fight very low like that. And we had a bout after several hours of training, and we ended up down on our haunches chasing each other around the gym. And then he knocked me on my butt, and it was awesome. Um, but the reality is, yeah, the 133 way to solve the problem is perfectly good. It's a legit thing. Um, Georgian sets up our stance differently, where 133 hip, hip hinges with a linear thing. Georgian stance for this to solve the same problem is more akin to back squatting. I get my feet squared and I get down. Right? This is a good stance. If you guys remember from the images, uh, the pictures I, I showed, right? Some of them we would see people literally down like this fighting, right? We would see this. Slightly different solutions to the same problem, optimized for based on geography, culture, weapon. Um, if we compare the two weapons, right now, Jim's sword here is a very typical sort of single handed sword, right? And I have a very typical Georgian white here. You'll notice that mine's a little shorter. I was pretty common in my cracks, I'm a large slave, a lot of Georgian plates here. Um, and by the single edge, big double sharp here. Um, earlier in period, they used uh, double edge swords, still with a, a shorter hilt and some other differences. Um, but they optimized to solve the problem. Did that answer the question? Or was I just babbling for my own ears? Because if it's the latter, I'll happily take another stab at it. Or have another stab taken it. Yeah, it looks like they said that you answered it, so perfection. Any quibbles with it too, please, please, please. I want to hear them because the way I get better is people poking holes in the stuff I know. Uh, sometimes, literally, all I have to burn off a little letter, keep my skin intact. You can poke holes in the theory, not in me, please. Um, okay, so let's see, where were we on the uh, IS? Rapid buckler striking. So we were doing these thrusts from under. We're going to talk about 
uh, after what we would cut. And in deference to our, uh, our friend who was doing all the names, I will be rolling into this. Jeff B. Jordan. You'll notice I have measure uh, significant. I love this. I had measure before, but I have really good measure. Um, so actually, you know, can you have a blocker and we'll just use it as a target here for a second? Um, so when I'm making this drop, and I'll go with the simplest cut I can think of in the days, right? Which is right here, right? And I'm going to flow out. And what I want to do is make sure that when I do this, my bumper stays ahead of my sword. So I'm here, and I come, right? Where did I end up? Again, behind the bump. And what looks like to I-33, my vision does. Hot shot. Right? I'm here. I can pull my places. But I can even, I can be set up and come from back here, right? Uh, let's see if I can set myself up right on here, and I flow out into a. The important part is that we're used to the bump bleeding. Because the real temptation for a lot of people is to do something that looks kind of like this. The goal of life. Those initial drills of striking with the bumper, moving it first, is to get it used to. If I have to have my arms on the seat, it's better for the bumper to be able to move ahead. Right? I can be here and come out. I'm not giving anything away through that. And in fact, it might be useful, right? As we said, the bumper clears the path. If there's a sword there for me to clear something, right? I'm going to do that. Uh, let's see, we put the buffer over there, and then pull the sword in the middle, right? So now I've got something, I want to get the sword in the you guys can see, right? You've got this on the line here, right? I want to get there, and I have to clear this sword aside for this, right? Right? The buffer leads that I can clear, right? As I'm here, I come. We get big crashing noises, and I can hit in general, that first drill we were doing before we're in here, right? What am I doing? I come, pop, right? So if I'm in here, I come, and I reach past that me, right? I come out, right? Moving the buffer lead. Now, ideally, I'm not going to be one, two. I'll make a sequence, right? I'm here in the house. But the two are together. But I want to come with the buffer first. Um, what's really fun and terrifying is when you start test cutting with the buffer and the same kind sword. Um, I have a really lovely uh, Georgian single hander that was built for me by Coach on the Gainsack. And every time I come with it, holding a buffer, I'm like, oh God, oh God, I'm going to hit my buckle. No, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to hit my buckle. It's okay. The sword was meant for it. And then I remember why the Georgians built their swords. And one of their light tests is to lay an iron nail on the anvil and chop it. They basically lay the light on it and pound the blade through with a hammer and then check to make sure it didn't take any damage. Because this happens all the time. Mike, could you jiggle your microphone a little bit just to. Um try and reset that. Okay. Are we, are we having volume it's, problems? Or? It's, it's coming and going a bit, yes. Uh oh There we go. Okay, is it better now? That sounds better. Okay, it may also be because I'm talking other directions, so I'll try and make sure I remember to face the camera and talk to the camera and enunciate clear. Um, okay, so Everything we've done here, we can do with other blows, right? Um, if I'm, you know, high 133 here, right? I'm coming from under, just hold the sword out for me at an angle, at an angle, give me something to right? So if I'm here and I want to cover, the two you have active buffer, right? Um, if I'm under here and I want to thrust, right? The two together. And if you'll notice in all these cases, I am joining. I am well together here, right? 
So we've done these that come together. Now I want to talk about the next level of supporting uh, the sword with the buckler. And this, you, you won't need the buckler yet, because we're gonna, we'll do the, uh, the hanging parry drill for this. Um, we're gonna talk about the other ways of covering. And this is, uh, we're gonna move to the sword alone just to demonstrate the drill. This is hanging parry drill. Um, you'll see this in Saber. We see this with Messers and Dusaks. Um, I first learned it as a Saber thing. Uh, but that's because that's where I started. So um, we do this with long swords too, by the way. Um, and with sword and buckler, but it's simplest to show here. So initially what will happen is Jim will go ahead and cut from my left, and I will cover, and I will return to that. And you will cut from my right, and I will cover from the right. And then you Spot. That snap happens before he can do it. And the power 
is there. So this is one thing I highly recommend for the practice. You're here, and the initial practice is going to be this. Roll to here and cut together, right? And then the other side, right here, right? So, because I can't, I don't have the, uh, the feedback the way I was hoping for as we do this. Um, I'm going to tell you guys a short story, which will lead into the next technique we're going to do. Um, I have a couple of Georgian friends who now reside in the U.S. on the East Coast. Um, Vakteng and Nico. And um, several years ago, they made a pilgrimage up into the mountains to seek out the last of the old masters, the old men who still studied this for real in their youth. And I've seen pictures and footage. These guys are missing finger joints, scars up and down the ribs from being cut. It's really incredible. Um, and some of them, it wasn't just, oh, they did this in their youth. Um, the NKVD and the Soviet Special Forces um, sort of came in and data mined Georgian martial arts for the Soviet military. Um, and in fact, one of the few surviving texts with good documentation on some of the Kevs or Ford and Buckler is in fact an NKVD, like non-commissioned officers training program. And there's anecdotes about Kevsur fighting Japanese during the First World War or the Russo-Japanese War, um, and well-known Japanese martial artists being impressed. You know, I always were mopping these guys up, and then we ran into two of these guys who were different, and they had swords, and they just ate my squad. Um, and, um, but Vakting and Nika were up. And for all that this, what we were doing here with these hanging drills looks kind of silly, um, in particular, that hanging on my, my sword side, Nico was fencing with an old Kevster man. I mean, not seriously fencing. They were, you know, sort of trying to learn from him. You can grab a, a sword and a buckler here for a second. And the sequence happened that kept looking something like this, right? Nico would make a, a cut, you know, something cut to my, to my right. He'd get it wrong. And the old man would come through, so, and thrust over. And he kept hitting Nico in the neck. Um, I don't know if you guys could see that from that angle. We'll swap angles here to show the same thing. All right, so we're here, and then we got a cover, right, cut through and around. This is where outside is better. I don't damage my cuts. Um, we used to have good ceilings in here, right? So I'm going to do this squirrel. Um, yeah, just me for this, right? So I'm here, right? And what happens is I come in, I cover, I drive through, beat the sword aside, snap around, and I'll Lunging thrust over the top, right? I can put it into the face, into the neck. If I miss those, come down into the body. The other thing that this is really good for is tight spaces. One of the things we see a lot, um, a lot of human texts are explicitly meant for one-on-one -on -one fighting. Um, even Marazzo, who tells us he was making his living training mercenaries, trains people for the dueling hall first, one-on-one -on -one honorable fight. Kevser Sword and Buckler being a village art, being something that was meant to keep you alive, yes, there's one-on-one -on -one stuff and there's formal rules. And they'll do things like, well, we're gonna settle this and we don't wanna hurt each other. So instead of holding my sword like this, I'm just gonna fight you with the spine of my sword. and I have to hit you. If I cut you in the hair area, I win. But if I cut you in the part of your face where you don't have hair, well, now I've got to pay you a penalty. We measure the, the, the wound and grains, and it, there's elaborate legal codes around it. Weirdly enough, or perhaps not so weirdly, guess what got culturally banned in Tetsuretti for reasons of danger? while well, they kept fighting for it. Right? What was banned? That. No thrusting. We literally see in some parts of Georgia kinjals that look like they have a screwdriver tip. No point. Can't thrust with them. 
Um, and some of my friends in Georgia, their theory on it is, well, these were, these were formal. I, I wasn't really serious. I didn't get the one with the point. I, I slashed him the heck, but I didn't stab him. I followed the rules, right? Um, so we see this here, and this is where we get into, you know, like I said, this next piece, this cut around, cut over, right? So we're playing, and those power moves lead us to things that, is, that allow these strikes. Right? So I'm here, boom, boom. I can still, I can cut through here, and if I have to, look what happens next. And this looks awkward on the surface, but if you take Jim out of the picture, it's not that bad. Right? And I'm one quick away from being back where I want. Now, to be fair, typically when I do this, I don't come over the top. I'll come around the side with that. It's more comfortable. Um, and it leaves my hands in a better place. But again, especially coming to my right, right? So, what do I do? Pass through and finish with the thrust. That's hard to this. Where else do we see this concept? We have some 133 players here. Everybody remember when we talked to the gladiator? Right, so if I'm here and, and I come, and Jim comes forward with the hot shield, and I come find him, he's laying the camera on me, right? So, what is that? That's the exact same principle, right? You know, I've come here, here's my hanger. What does this look like? There's my hanger. Strike down, and here we finish with a cut instead of the thrust I was using on the other side. But it's the same principles, which highlights what I was trying to get at before, that these are universal principles of buckler use that you can apply in multiple places. We see them all over. And once we're aware of them, and you go to watch buckler footage, good buckler footage, or go look at the text again, you'll see them there. Um, we can talk a little bit, and in fact, we will talk a little bit um, about connecting this all to other forms. You've seen us play this with, uh, with a dagger. Um, we're looking at about 620 right now. So my goal here is to finish between sort of 630, 645-ish, um, give people some time for a break and to get to the shindig and all that good stuff. Um, you have a question, Mike, if you're... Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, got a question from Alex. Uh, in this system, is there a particular method of countering feints that might put your buckler out of position? Uh, E.g., with the common feint high right, cut underneath the buckler attack that most systems do. And it sounds yes. like you're about to get into, you know, working with us with 133, so good time. Yeah, so perfect. Um, so in Georgian, and you're asking about the faint high right, cut low right. I believe the, the very common sequence we see. Yeah, we see the same uh, thing. In yeah, let me just read over it again. Uh, the, mo the common faint high right, cut underneath the buckler. Yes, and Alex confirms, yes, that's what he's that's yep. what talking about. So here's where we have one in Georgia. You'll be the, uh, the faint. So, so the sequence I believe is being described is to go ahead, faint high right, faint high right. So not straight shot, no, that's your left. You're right. You're right. Yeah, you're going to faint to there, and then as I react, you want to cut on. Yes, the Georgian solution to this is very simple. I seek, and I screwed it up. Okay. Um, I'm going to seek. We're coming in, I'm going to seek, and as I can adjust, I want to get close to you, and we will very slowly. Right, so we're here, just coming in. I want to get close. What happens when I'm down and I adjust and follow the sword? Is it perfect? No. What it requires is very aggressive buckler use. Can I get you, this is a perfect time for this. Yeah. Um, no, no, um, buckler oh, battle. Yeah. I promise we talk about this well a little bit later here. We're gonna be very, usually this tempo goes up and do a lot of movement here. Um, what's gonna happen in this drill, this is one of our very useful drills I stole from some guys back in Georgia in the 1980s. Um, is this. Jim has two swords. What this means is that Jim can deliver blows at a very rapid pace without having to deliver really hard blows. So his goal is to hit me. My goal is to cover. Ah, you got me 
that time. Um, usually we do this with masks on and faster. But if you'll notice how I'm dealing with these strikes, we'll slow really down as he comes in. I come in, I come in, I come in. I'm getting inside his reach. And I'm actually driving him backwards and forcing him to circle. Georgian requires highly aggressive butler um, and highly aggressive attack. Um, retreating does not, it says the suburb who's used to doing a seating parry all the time. Um, it was so much easier to hit you before you stopped doing that. Um, Georgian really requires aggressive butler use. And we're told this, every written record we have of the Kevser fighting dating back into the uh, 18th and 19th centuries shows, refers to, they don't back up. They don't retreat. At most, they'll feel like I'm too close and we'll take a step or two moving back and circularly to gain space for the weapons. Everything is aggressive. Defense is, a, is offensive. Um, when my counterattack to everything is punching with a buffer, what do I want to do? Punch it with a buffer. I want to get in close. Right. I don't want us to run into anything. And we're speeding up as we do this too. Um, so, right, we have this aggressive system. Did I answer your question, Alex? If not, next time we're together, we can go over some of it. It's not a perfect solution, it's a solution. Um, I, not other only did you answer the is, question, they mentioned that it uh, it may even look a little familiar to them. So, sounds like so they might have a similar solution in 133, yeah. Yeah, the other thing is that in Georgian, I will almost never simply cover without countering immediately. Right, so even if, I, even if you faint, I move into that cover. If I don't pick up your sword, I'm countering to you. I'm going to force you to react to me. Um, that being said, that high low combo is a fun one to train. I do that all the time. Uh, a couple years back, I got a little carried away and had a student get mad at me because he ended up with a nice linear bruise on his left thigh where he was being struck with Rattan as we were doing this over and over. I felt really terrible for him. Um, so now I don't do that that many times with one person because I kept hitting him in the exact same spot. Um, which I guess yay me, but also not yay me. I need to vary it or, or go a lot lighter if I'm gonna hit somebody in the same spot over and over. Um, thrusting under, thrusting over, yeah. Um, so, and yeah, Alex, at some point, we, we still need to get a chance to sit down and like do a comparative and walk through stuff. Um, Cause I never did get to do that with you at the uh, Buckler Fest because I got sick. Okay, so the other thing I want to do is we've connected this to dagger. I want to connect this upstream to the larger round shields. Um, why? Well, partly because, you know, I'll be honest, um, sword and shield is what made me want to do Kima in the beginning, back in the day. Um, and we can do this Bolognese, the Rotella is a very Bolognese thing. Um, but I want to connect those same movements of the buckler to the rotella. So, and add a fourth. So, if our aggressive movements with the buckler, right, were to punch with it, to backhand, forehand, up and down, remember that movement where we turn the wrist? Well, with the rotella, if I want to cover low, I rotate right on here. I'm doing the same thing, rotating down. If we're here and I want to cover high, boxers block. Right? You can see us as we're doing this, it comes in, right? We're here. Right? It's just a boxers block with the shield in my hand to cover me. Right? If I'm striking with the rotella with my thrust or something, and I'll thrust here, right? I'm going to come and punch forward. Right? So I came from my, sh my shield here to forward to lock off that line. Um, because of space, I'm leaving, I'm going to back up so I can actually extend my arm fully. Right, so I'm here and you go, boom. Right, and you can see here, I'm covered at the edge. 
You can also see, if you bring it into the camera here, the um, edge of my rotel, I don't know if it comes across here, is all chewed up and the red showing through uh, from where my sword hits it repeatedly. Um, and that's our, our sort of chief motions. I'm here, I'm extended, I'm down, I'm up. And we can make plays on this. Um, Jim, can I get you to come over here where we're away from the yeah. bookshelf full of retro yeah, things? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the opening actions in uh, Marazzo's Sword and Rotella, right? He tells us that we advance, making a thrust under our shield, then place our shield under our opponent's arm, right? So I'm going to make a thrust to draw him high, right? And when you come high to cover, right, I'm going to, I'm going to adjust. So we're here, right? And I come, here's my thrust to draw you high, right? And as soon as you come high, I come in. I place my shield under. And I've seen a lot of interpretations of this. Being very Georgian, the one that makes me the happiest, right, as I'm here, and I come across is this extension, right? I'm here. Extend here. And by extending initially and joining these two, no matter where he takes me in the cover, the natural follow on for me is to literally just move forward and my shield's already there underneath. If, for example, we were to do something, I'm going to come here, and let's say you cover, you get a counter with a low. As I come in, you're going to cut low, right? As I'm coming here, I'm going to, right, you're going to cut low. All right, all I have to do is extend here. Okay, remember those same two cuts with the buckler where we did the hangers? What's this look like with the rotel? I'm here. Boom. All right? Interestingly enough, I find that the offhand one is almost easier. I'm going to switch sides. Yeah, right, we're here. So as he comes in right here, I come I'm here. Right? And I'll do this forward to the camera separately too, thanks to Right? Simple motions of the rotella. And this holds the same principles hold with the buckler, hold with the dagger, right? I come. I want to, if I'm here and I want to cover myself, I'm safe here. Where can I be struck from above? I shed both ways and I have power to cut. Right? Those who like to play with shield, this is an excellent fun one here. Right? The basic things I'll do with shield, I'll start, and I'm here and out of presence, and I'm going to come forward. Right? I'm here and out of presence, I'm going to come forward. And then, if I've been deflected, cut around. Hey, what was I doing with sword and buckler? Here's my, what I call the Fiore test. Is it simple? Does it hold across weapons and across systems? I'm going to be Georgian here for a second because I love Georgian. From the title of this, you can tell. That same exact action, right, where we're here, right, coming forward. If I'm here and I'm out of vision, I'm fighting a shield play, right? I don't want to do something here. Right? I come over. Jim, I want you to receive. I'm going to be aggressive here. Okay. Right? So I can build my same seat. Right? I'm here. You're there. I'm going to come in. Thrust forward. You've covered. Right? You can go ahead and play with your shield okay. over your head. Right. right? We're here. Right? I come in. And boom. I move behind. And as soon as his eyes are blocked, retarget. You get my eyes so long. Right. As Nice Let's say we're here and you push me to the shield. I'm going to come in and you push me to the shield side. No, I hit you that time. Sorry. Right. right. I have options and it's the same sequence. And I'm going to go towards the camera here. Just right. I'm in here. Um, and being Georgian, I'll probably start here. I'll start here just for shits and giggles. Right. And I'm here and I come forward. And if I'm paired up, same actions. This is what I like to call the Fiore test. Can I take the principle? Can I apply it to a different weapon and does it hold? Can I apply it to a different sequence or system and does it hold? Can I simplify it and still make it work? Um, and that's what you're seeing here today is the results of me taking all of the Georgian sword and buckler that I've seen and studied 
what 133 I have, what bolognese I have, and data mining them for the places that Georgian focus on a very active buckler on simple mood motions and mechanics can be taken and applied across all of the systems in a successful manner. Um, and no matter what you study, no matter how you study it, I invite you to go play with these things um, and to um, you know, get in touch with me. Tell me, hey, I tried this thing and it didn't work. I want to know that. Um, maybe you're not doing it the way I envisioned it being done. Maybe you found a hole. I've got to go plug a hole. I can get better through your experiments. Um, the principles we focused on today, right? Buckler moves first or at the same time. Larger, simpler motions, larger muscle groups, simpler motions are preferred, but we can't eliminate all the fine-tuned ones. What I do like to eliminate in the Georgian system um, are the things, sadly, that like Roland Morcheka does really, really well. I love fighting with Roland because like you hit him and magic happens and his sword operates through you and, and you get hit. It's awesome. But to accomplish that, there's all these little fine motions of the two wrists rolling together. And they're great. But when you're under stress and you're exhausted, they're really hard to do. Um, he is a consummate duelist. If I think of Battlefield 133, I don't think of, of, of Roland. I think of Miroslav Leshikov from Bulgaria, whose 133 looks completely different from Roland's. But his habitual practice is to fight two or three of his students at the same time versus Roland's, let's just go to Sharps and try and make it all look the same. Different approaches, different goals. Um, my own goal is to try and burn things into myself so that I can do them exhausted with, you know, muscles cramping and my brain seized up on no sleep for two days. I want it to work. Right? How simple can I make it? Um, again, another principle today. Different tool, same principle. Does it apply? Georgian buckler, Western buckler, does it still work? Georgian attack versus 133 attack versus Bolognese attack, does it still work? And lastly but not least, because of all this, what I like to say, cones, cones, cones. Anybody who studied classical or sport fencing will tell you. The cone of defense, right? You can think of this. Uh, anybody took Alex Spryer's um, Spear as Foil class um, a couple years ago or the Polak stuff? It's all about cones and angles. The advantage of a buckler lies in the cone that it takes away from my opponent, right? So if Jim and I are fighting, my buckler is back here by my body. There's not a very big cone it takes away. If my sheet, my buckler is out here, there's a really big cone this takes away. Um, Stephen Hand highlights this really well in a recent video about kite shields um, and how those were used, they think. Um, I encourage people to go watch that if you're interested in it. Uh, he says it better than I can, I think. Um, but that cone and that aggressive buckler use. When I when he when Jim had two swords and I had my buckler, I have to get close. I have to get in, and that's why we use that drill. Um, because of the way we did this, um, what I think I'm going to do is when the air quality here improves, I will go ahead and film each of the drills that I wanted to cover today that we weren't necessarily able to cover in the proper form. I didn't have my pal or something. Um, and, and post those and share those with the uh, Sword Squatch uh, folks so that you all can have a reference for what I was trying to get at. Um, thank you guys for bearing with me. Um, we're, you know, with our emergency redirection in the house where we could breathe. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's sort of what I prepared for today. We're right in the time zone I plan to get to. Um, so any last questions before we wrap up for today? Yeah, any questions, post them to the Q&A, post them in chat. Um, 
if you have been following along and doing some sword and buckler in your living room and you want some pointers, we can absolutely enable your camera if you're interested. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give feedback or answer questions if people want to show me something and ask or just, hey, is this what you meant when you were showing this? Uh, Kristen asks, big shields in Georgia. Yes. 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 Um, so Georgia is, is interesting. Um, we mostly see round shields, um, but we see them in several forms. We see a lenticular form, like the strap rotellas that we were using. Um, not typically quite as large as mine. You know, this is a sled and I'm a very large human being. Um, Georgian round shields were typically a little smaller than this, and they were strapped multiple ways. They would have a, a, an elbow and grip strap, and they would also have a center grip strap akin to the back of the buckler, where I can just grab through and grip it in the middle. Um, we don't have a lot of information on why they were strapped both ways, um, but my personal theory is that the arm, the elbow strap was used on horseback more than anything to free and to give rein work. And then on foot, the center grip was preferred for mobility. We know from the historical record that in Kev Soretti, they originally used, um, well, originally they used a round wooden shield and a sword that looked rather like this. By the 15th century, this sword had a cross like this and had moved to a cylindrical pommel like on my parrying dagger and then that pommel bent over akin to the sham shears eventually ending in a form that looked more like this um and that the shield grew smaller over time um to the buckler we see today or even smaller fist-sized bucklers that would literally be hung inside the clothing for daily work, protecting the vitals. Uh, what was called, an, the, world, the word used for both shield and for buckler in Georgia is pari. Um, ironic, we use the word parry for something we parry with. Um, but the very small hidden ones were an ubis pari. Um, I, have, I, have, I, have, I have a very long slideshow about this stuff that I, I can go into at another time. Um, but yes, we do see flat or lenticular. The other form of round shield we see in Georgia, and there's some very famous ones, including the so-called shield of Queen Tamar, um, which isn't, it's not even from her era. Um, and it was taken as a trophy, as far as we can tell, from another local region, is they would take and basically make a round shield and then curve it on one axis, like a curved heater. And it would still be strapped for um, show for grip and elbow or center grip and there would be a hanging strap on it that you could for slinging it over your back or to be used as a guise strap. Um, so yeah, round shield used larger and smaller was very common. Uh, anything from fist size up to larger wooden shields in the two to three foot diameter range. Other nice. questions? And there is, uh, there is another question, yeah. Uh, where do you get bucklers and shields? Actually, you know, where do you get swords too? We might as well throw that in there, right? <laughs> All right, so finding good swords for Georgian has been a, a trial. Um, I'm gonna cover the bucklers first and then we'll talk about swords. Um, so for shields, um, you know, you can just buy a Rotella or for a lot less money, you could buy a, a round metal saucer sled. That's what Jim and I are using. They're a little large. And then, you know, drill it out and mount handles. Um, you can also just use a flat round piece of plywood and, and some old belts welded to it. That works. It's perfectly fine for Georgian. For the fancy Georgian style bucklers with all the cutouts and the pretty on this, um, these I have a guy in the Ukraine that makes for us. It's uh, Armory Werewolf of all things. Um, yeah, he's got a yeah he's got a werewolf on the back of him, um, which sounds very sort of Nazi white supremacist, but it's not. He just really likes werewolves. In fact, he's heavily affiliated with Razmov Tsar, the Persian uh, martial arts troupe, um, and it was Dr. Korasani who turned me on to him. 
Um, these style of bucklers like Jim and I have are not cheap, unfortunately. Um, you'll see a difference between his and mine. Mine has, you can see there's rolled edges on it. His does not. Um, last time we ordered a batch of them, the ones without ruled edges were like 90 bucks, I think. And this one was 120, I think, to get the extra work. These are also, by the way, hardened. He, he puts these all together and then he, he heat treats them. So they're really tough. They're actually a lot tougher than the Georgian originals, which tend to be mild. And a lot of the guys I know in Georgia can do this. You'll see their bucklers just all work from use. Um, if we have enough people interested, I can put together another group order. Um, in fact, I think I have three or four people from our own group that want them now that weren't with us when we did the last order. Um, so mm -hmm. talk to me, um, and I, I can get you in touch with the, the guy that makes them. Now, for trainers, we've had a lot of different things over the years. Um, I actually own but like four or five distinctly different training swords as well as my sharps now for Georgian. Um, the first ones I have were a pair that Darkwood made for me. Um, I don't have those out today. They're built off of their, their back sword blades. They're very pretty, but the blades are too long. Um, I have another sword I had built for me by um, Georgi Lakabidze back in Tbilisi in Georgia. Beautiful sword. I should have brought it out today, but it is stiff. Uh, Georgia's idea of training swords is make them thick and soft so they don't break. And you just toughen up your wrists using them. And if they turn into a buzzsaw, well, you should have maintained it better. Wonderful, beautiful sword. Not legal in any US events. For an inexpensive trainer, um, this is what we have that I like for, for cheap. Um, this was is basically SGT's Messer, only with the cross shortened, the nagel cut off, and the grip shortened. Um, if I had it to do it again, I would probably actually shorten the blade of hair as well, and I would make this grip even shorter. Even with heavy hands, it's a little long uh, for the Georgian grip. My current favorite sword is this. Um, this is the first prototype from Shrike. Uh, Armor uh, Shrike's Forge down in Southern Oregon. Uh, Mark Howland, who used to be the customs guy at Castile, went independent uh, about a year ago. Um, and he sat down with me and we worked these up um, from scratch specifically to do, um, to look and handle like the Georgian Sharps I have and meet American standards. Um, where the beautiful Georgian trainer I have is to stiff for anything this one no problem 90 degree bend right we're good straightens no problem you can see on these um there's a nice flared fat tip uh it's square on the front it still moves and handles this one's the prototype so there's a few things about it you wouldn't see it's got a rattle in the cross it's a side effect of the way we built it to take it apart again this is meant to be taken apart so we can check and we've been basically brutalizing it to make sure his construction stands up to everything I can put it through. Um, and in the production models, at least in mine that he's building me, I shortened the cross a little bit and changed the grip. This is a very simple grip. Um, Georgian grips tended to be highly elaborate with lots of plating and studs and, and everything on them. Um, and I have some of those I can pull out and, and share. I actually have a, a review of this sword um, posted in our Facebook group, PMW Parakeaba, and on um, my Georgian blog um, through our group. So www.nwarmansare.parakeaba. Um, just ping or comment in the Sword Swatch stuff, and I'll put the links in there for everybody. Um, I didn't want to try and put them in the presentation because that is just always there. But um, yeah. among and other this, things, uh... This video will be posting up to Facebook and you can just post in the comments of this video even. Perfect, I'll just put comments on links to the sword makers and what we've got, um, the buckler, and um, also to um, our YouTube group and our blog and the Facebook group that are all dedicated to the Georgian stuff for those who wanna go Georgian. Um, I love it. 
Um, it's just, it's different and it's interesting. I never, never set out to try and do Georgian swordplay. I was actually looking for Russian stuff when I found it. Um, and in fact, the main text, Elish Vili's Parakeva is written in Russian. Um, so I was able to translate it. Um, I'm still working on learning Georgian so I can dig into the few other written sources we have. Um, but for those who are interested in it, Georgian mythology, um, there are English translations of their national epic poem, The Night in the Panther Skin, which dates, well, a more, it would be better to call it The Night in the Tiger Skin, but it translates, it's always titled The Night in the Panther Skin in English, which pisses Georgians off who speak both languages. But um, it dates to the 13th century roughly, and it's still taught in their high schools today, and it can still be read in its original. Uh, the language has stayed constant enough that it's like reading Shakespeare for us. Awesome. Well, that's probably a good place to, to I call it a day. Put up there. Yeah. Right. I guess we'll have some. We'll have some time. Everybody will have some time to prepare for the uh, the next session, which is the uh, Cyber Squatch Shindig, which is going from uh, around seven to around eight. Um, and at eight, we are starting off the. Uh, the D and D one shot campaign that our our own Shane Malone has, uh, I believe, pre recorded. So we'll just be watching the stream, um, commenting along. It'll be a good time. So hope to see you at those. Uh, thanks a ton, Mike. That was a great presentation. Thanks a ton, Jim, for thank helping you all for out. Thank with me and my odd love to uh, from Georgia, and thank you to Jim for braving bad air and COVID and all this to come hang out and play Walking Pell for me today, so. <laughs> Heck yes. Thank you to Carrie and Michael for being our, uh, our mods today, our, our backup mods, love it. And thanks to everybody for attending. And hopefully we will see you at uh, tonight's Shindig in just about 10 minutes and also during the D&D &D campaign and at our, our, uh, the next six sessions that are coming up on Saturday and Sunday. Yep, I know I've got, I'm signed up for some of this weekend, so there's some cool stuff coming down the pipe. Heck yeah, still plenty of time to register. So see y'all soon. Have a good All one, right. Mike. Miss you guys. Thanks,